Good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Dave. Hi there. Good afternoon. My name is Ivar. Welcome. Yes. Today we're going to, uh, to talk about a very interesting subject, STI, yeah. but more about that later. Before we, uh, we go there, I would like to highlight that we, uh, you can leave questions during the webinar. Yeah. Uh, we have a Q&A tab in your webinar view. Please leave them there. Uh, we will review your questions at the end of the webinar. So that, that being said, uh, said Ivar, let's, uh, let's talk about this webinar for today. STI. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're not going to do it together. Uh, we have our colleague also in this webinar. Um, Thomas, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yes, there you Hi, are. Thomas. How are you, uh, our master in STI? Yeah, I can say that. Yeah, thanks for the flowers. I'm pretty fine. I hope you guys are well too. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, thank you for for uh, yeah for being with us and and uh, doing this webinar. So yeah, it's quite complex. Uh, this is a quite complex topic. So we need at least 45 minutes up to maybe 60 minutes. So uh, depending on also the questions. So I think it's good to start. And uh, Thomas, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thanks very much, guys. Um, yeah, this is the first uh, part of a two-part webinar where I'm going to talk about the speech transmission index, a very important metric for speech intelligibility. Um, but before I start with that, I'd like to give you a quick update about who I am and what I have been doing in the past 25 years since I've joined Bose <clears throat> in 1995. So. <clears throat> the pretty early, starting with model and auditioner uh, computer simulation, I specialized in intelligibility of sound systems. Uh, and that was particularly the case after Bose has co-invented the stipameters together with a uh, research institute in the Netherlands uh, in 2001. And since then, I uh, became a working member in quite a number of standards group that deal with uh, voice alarm and emergency sound systems and things like that in Germany and Europe. And since uh, 2005, I'm also a member of the maintenance team of the IEC, the International Electric Electrical Commission, uh, the maintenance team for the STI standard. So um, having said this, this is our agenda for today. Um, we will start with a quick introduction, a little bit of motivation, what this is all about. And then the main topic I'm gonna to cover today is the so-called modulation transfer function. It's a basic ingredient, so to speak, to the speech transmission index and understanding what the modulation transfer function is and um, how it is affected in sound systems is the main content of the talk today. So let's start with the introduction. And um, I typically start this presentation with a little bit of what we call a progress report. So uh, we will start um, with a little video um, from a movie um, by Jacques Tati. Français, Les Vacances de Monsieur Hulot, uh, I think from 1953 or something, so pretty old movie. Uh, and yeah, maybe a typical communication situation uh, from back then. Uh, so the question is, how is it today? Has anything changed? Is this still a typical quality that we can expect, for example, for a railway station? So certainly lots of things have happened since then, since 1953. And the question is a little bit, how is this going to evolve in the future? Is there anything going to change? Because intelligibility is, of course, very important. It's important to entertain, it's important to educate, it's important to inform, and of course also to evacuate. And especially when it comes to the last item, 
policymakers, they know too that intelligibility is important. So we can list a couple of standards that deal with, for example, emergency sound systems. Uh, there's a relatively new European standard. Uh, there are some two older ones from the UK. There's relatively new standards that cover so-called voice alarm systems. There's a European technical specification for that. There's an ISO standard, and there's, for example, also a German application standard for voice alarm systems. And then there are things like, for example, the US fire alarm code. And what all these standards have in common is that they require a minimum intelligibility for such a system. And this criterion is typically expressed in the form of the speech transmission index and a certain value that the system needs to achieve. Uh, the STI itself, the speech transmission index, is a standardized procedure. Uh, it's standardized in IEC standard with uh, national or regional copies like EN or BS or DEAN, things like that. The number is 6268 uh, part 16. So for those of you who are familiar with um, electroacoustics, you may know that uh, 6268 series also covers things like loudspeakers, microphones, um, amplifiers, test signals, and so forth. And one particular part, part 16, is dealing with the speech transmission index. Yeah, but although we have all these standards, things like this may happen. We see here a picture of Boston Convention Center. And uh, when they wanted to open it, uh, like about 10 years ago, um, I'm quoting here from a local newspaper, uh, the $800 million building, quarter mile long, received high praise for its cutting edge architecture. However, this convention center was denied a certificate of occupancy, so they couldn't open the venue because emergency announcements from the emergency system could not be heard clearly. So that's, of course, not something we do not want to happen. We want to design emergency systems where the customer can reliably um, use his building. So to understand more about the STI and the underlying modulation transfer function, we will right jump into an introduction to what speech intelligibility actually is. And it's very important to understand that um, we look at a few properties of speech um, and how the modulation transfer function can be defined for typical things like speech. And we will also look at some factors that influence the modulation transfer function. Um, and those are noise, reverberation, but also echoes. And we will learn what the difference is between reverberation and echoes. So there's a standard, and yet another standard, um, ISO 9921, uh, which is dealing with um, speech or general ergonomics. And they have a definition of speech intelligibility by saying intelligibility is a measure of the effectiveness of a speech communication. And the stress here is really on the word effectiveness. So it is not necessarily about quality, right? It's not necessarily about that Thomas sounds like Thomas sounds when he talks to you without the microphone. It's about how much effort is involved for a listener to understand the content of a speech communication. So we want that the content is transmitted. We are not so much interested in that it sounds great, right? We need to transmit information. <clears throat> so now it is very important to understand that intelligibility is something that you cannot physically measure, right? They, you cannot like take a voltmeter or a sound level meter and just measure what intelligibility is because intelligibility is a measure that also involves human senses and how humans perceive for example, speech. So since we cannot attach a measurement device to you, our brains, we have to find a workaround to that. So we can try and attempt to measure objectively certain parameters of a transmission system. So we try to measure intelligibility, but we have to 
note that these measured values only have a certain relationship to what humans subjectively perceive as intelligibility. So there are quite many factors that influence intelligibility, and we will look at those um, in this course and also in the next one, um, because we are interested in how these factors can actually be measured. So if we want to quantify speech intelligibility, we can do that by doing subjective tests using uh, human listeners. And um, there's a variety of methods that do not necessarily have to do with sound systems or things like that. Uh, speech intelligibility is important in many aspects of human life. So a lot of researchers are dealing with this from completely different perspectives. And one thing is to evaluate so-called phonemes. Phonemes are the parts of which speech is made up. So that could, for example, or typically those are consonants and vowels. So vowels are a, o, u, e, a. They don't contain much information, but if you have a consonant, which is like a hard sounding uh, word component, like those contain information and transmit it to the listener. So there are tests for example, the articulation loss of consonants that you can subjectively test using um, humans. You can also test for complete words, not just for the phonemes. And if you test for words, uh, it could be words that have a meaning, um, or it could also be words that are nonsense words, where it's really important to understand the word without understanding it out of the context. And by the way, for both of these um, um, methods, both meaningful or nonsense words, it's important that they are embedded in what we call a carrier phrase. And I will talk about that in just a minute again. So next step would be do not test for words, but check for complete sentences. So uh, sentences are read to the listener and uh, it is evaluated if the complete sentence has been completely understood. A problem with the subjective testing is, although the, these are the most precise measurements you can do because you are involving the actual subject, um, it is very cumbersome. So if you have one typical condition that you would like to test, you need about a thousand words that need to be read and noted before you have a statistically reliable result for the actual intelligibility number. So because of that effort, uh, subjective tests are primarily only used for the verification of objective tests, right? So you try to keep the workload down by using objective measurement systems, but you have to verify those and relate their results to what would be subjectively perceived. And that is something we do not do in the field. That is something that is typically only done by research institutions. So yeah, what are these objective test methods that we have? And uh, formally, traditionally, or historically, there was a, uh, or there still is, um, a speech intelligibility index. It's abbreviated SII. It was uh, formally called the articulation index. Um, and um, it is based on signal to noise ratio in different frequency bands. So. That also already tells us that, um, well, if we only look at signal and noise, maybe it's a little bit difficult to look at particular things like reverberation or maybe even echoes. So yeah, we can evaluate signal to noise ratio, which is often a problem with uh, intelligibility and we can evaluate frequency response, but nothing or not too much beyond that. So another standard was developed or another method was developed the so-called speech transmission index, not intelligibility index, but transmission index. It's abbreviated STI. Uh, it has a couple of, uh, say, implementations, and the most important ones are called full STI. I come back to that in the second part. Um, or Stitel for telephone applications. Then there was RASTI. We grayed it out because it has been removed from the standard in the meantime. That was for room acoustical uh, speech transmission. So typical scenario, we have a talker without loudspeakers in a lecture room and you want to figure out how intelligible that talker is. And then 
as I already mentioned, early 2000s, um, another method was developed called STIPA or S-T-I-P-A. And you can already guess it. That's a special method developed for the evaluation of sound systems. Yeah, but we, before we go into the objective testing, let me quickly give you an example for subjective testing. Would you write clove now? Would you write hunt now? Would you write mange now? Would you write rag now? Okay, so what you just heard um, was a phonetically balanced words test. So, and as you heard, it was using a single test word, but the test word was included or embedded in a so-called carrier sentence. And why is that important? So typically, if you have a communication channel, um, the channel needs a little bit of time to get what we will call excited. Um, if you have a room with reverberation, it takes a little bit of time until the reverberation starts in that room. And if you want to include those effects in your um, testing, then a single word is not enough because it wouldn't even cause the reverberation to cover the meaning of that word. So you have a carrier sentence that starts with always the same words. Would you write the word so-and-so now, right? And then the subjective um, testing person that needs to evaluate this, and I'll show you a picture of how this looks like in just a second, um, they have to just pick up the test word and write that down. And then afterwards, that's evaluated. Another method is, to, as I said, to write complete sentences. And uh, here are a few examples of uh, complete sentences. The front door may be stuck. The long alley was badly lit. The chicken laid no more eggs. The room was said to be quiet. We arrived home just in time. Okay, so um, what you see here is an image um, from TNO Laboratories, and thanks to Hermann Steniken uh, for the image that I stole from one of his presentations. Um, here you see four test persons, and they are in an anechoic room. They listen to the recordings via headphones. And uh, at the same time, they use a computer to write down uh, the test words. So how can we move on with predicting intelligibility? And prediction in a sense of that you, um, for example, use a formula to do that. So unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into all the different methods that have been developed to, for simple communication systems to predict intelligibility. So we will have to abbreviate that a little bit and say the state of the art to do this is to use a computer model. And many of you know uh, that a variety of software programs exist to predict acoustic metrics. Uh, in simulation, uh, you may have heard of Ease or Catacoustics or Odeon and, of course, uh, our own program called Bose Modeler, uh, which we are developing since uh, the 1980s. <clears throat> and um, all of these programs allow also the option to make an oralization, uh, that is to make an audible simulation, uh, which you can subjectively listen to. Right? So you're not predicting just uh, a number or something that describes intelligibility. If you have a good simulation system, it'll also allow you to listen to it. As with all simulations, um, the results from the simulation can only be as good as what you put into the simulation. So garbage in, garbage out. Of course, that's not something we would like to do. So it's very important that if you have a simulation model, you calibrate it with regards to what are the room acoustical boundary conditions. And for example, what, uh, what is the background noise that you have to take into account for your simulation? And uh, if we do a good simulation in a good program, a well-simulated impulse response, uh, in Modeler we call it an HEDC, a hybrid energy decay curve, 
uh, it looks like this, for example. Um, it's a display of level over time, right? So on the vertical axis, you see level in decibels. On the horizontal, you see time in milliseconds going from zero to about one second. And uh, such a hybrid energy decay curve consists of several um, typical components. So here you already see indicated those are all the red pins. You see direct sound arrivals. So arrivals that come from a loudspeaker that have a direct connection to where the listener is located. Then we have so-called discrete reflections. Uh, but then we also have something that we call a reverberant field envelope. And that is describing the level of the diffuse sound at a certain location in that simulation model. And that's this orange yellowish line you see. Uh, and what you can also see that level changes over time. So it could be that it raises strongly in the beginning, uh, drops again, raises again. And then at some point, very late in time, you see it drops off with a constant uh, time, so the curve is very straight, and that's what we typically call an exponential decay of reverberation. So heading on, if you have such a simulated impulse response, you can use a method that has been developed by Manfred Schröder, famous acoustician from uh, Germany, and he developed a method to calculate the complex modulation transfer function for so-called linear time invariant systems. So those are systems we typically deal with um, when we talk about sound systems. Now, this is probably the only formula for today. I'm not exactly sure, but wow, an integral. No, two integrals. Ah. So you don't have to understand this uh, in detail. So what we are trying to do here is um, we are taking a so-called Fourier transform of the impulse response to be exact from the squared impulse response. So what you see here is an integral, um, and then you see h, that's the impulse response, h from t, it's squared, and then this whole thing with e to the power of something, uh, that's the Fourier transform. And then you divide that by something different, and that is essentially the energy of the impulse response. So that's the basic method how you calculate a complex MTF from an impulse response. And that is exactly the same method that is applied in simulation programs or in advanced measurement systems that can measure an impulse response. And if you use those measurement systems or if you use simulation programs, uh, you have to um, regard certain requirements for predicting the impulse response. So uh, impulse response need to have a minimum length and of course it also has to have a minimum bandwidth. Here's a typical simulation result from Modeler actually. So this is a um, sound system for a large uh, trade fair hall. You can see a little picture in the upper left with an exhibition. Uh, it's a distributed system, quite large hall. I think it was like 25 meters high or something. So we have distributed horn systems in the ceiling. Uh, and here you see a mapping of speech intelligibility for the entire trade show hall, right? And you see it together with a color map on the top that indicates which color belongs to which STI value. And on the bottom right, you also see a statistical evaluation. And in the second part of the webinar, we will talk much more about statistical evaluation of such systems. But before we get started with the modulation transfer function, let's listen to a few typical scenarios. So we get a little bit of calibration on the STI scale. So I've created a test room in simulation. So what we are going to listen to is simulated uh, audio from Modeler. Uh, it's a square room. Uh, it is diffuse. So it has so-called scattering surfaces and no discrete reflections from any of the surfaces in the room. Uh, it has a single omnidirectional source. 
uh, it uh, has essentially only reverberation. So we don't add any noise and there are also no discrete echoes that we would add to the simulation. And in order to get a decent range of intelligibility values, I made two different rooms, same size, but different materials, so different reverberation times. One of the two rooms, and you will easily hear that when you hear the examples, one of the two rooms has about one second of reverberation time and the other room has about five seconds of reverberation time. So here are the um, audio examples. Um, on the right, you see a simple descriptive scale for the STI. So you see five different buckets for bad, poor, fair, good, or excellent intelligibility and the associated um, STI values. And on the left, you see we have uh, examples available from STI 0.33, so that's very bad, to about uh, 0.81, which is excellent and which is something you will only rarely achieve if you are working with sound systems. So I'm going to play you a couple of uh, audio tracks. We have another colleague from research, from engineering speaking, Joe Cotill, um, and have fun. We start with the 0.33, and then I will consecutively walk you through the other examples until we get to 0.81. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Patel, and I'm a member of the research staff here at Post Corporation. So we always only play this short excerpt, um, and I think what everybody could hear is, um, in the very beginning of this example, the intelligibility was very high. So good afternoon. That was very good to understand. But then exactly the problem occurred that I just described a few minutes ago. The reverberation was excited in that large room. So in the first one or two seconds, the reverb didn't come back to the listener, but then it came back. And after a few seconds, it starts to make the speech unintelligible. And when we listen to the next example, you will still be able to hear this effect. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Patil, and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Patil, and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. So that was an STI of 0.51. So this is roughly what we need to aim for if we are designing emergency or voice alarm sound systems. Head on with 0.61. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Cattell, and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. So you can hear that was apparently in the other room, in the room with the short reverberation. So the first three examples were in the reverberant room, and now the other ones are in the a little bit drier room. Let's continue with 0 0.67. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Cattell, and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. And finally, 0.81. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Cattell, and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. Okay, so this is our subjective calibration, right? We heard six different tracks going from 0.3 to 0.8, and let's wrap this up. What did we learn with these examples? We got calibrated a little bit on the scale. Uh, the one second room is pretty okay. The five second room is apparently pretty bad. Um, we can say the intelligibility is also highly correlated to what we would call clarity, so the clarity of the announcements. Uh, and uh, what was maybe a little bit more difficult to hear, but what I would also like to stress is that the if you compare STI against intelligibility of the entire sentence or the words, you have probably heard that it's highly nonlinear. So when we went from 0.6 to 0.8, we could probably all 
uh, say that the impact on word intelligibility or even sentence intelligibility was much smaller than when we went from 0.4 to 0.6, although the difference is the same in, two, in both cases, right? The difference is always 0.2 on the STI scale, but apparently if the values are much lower, then 0.2 make a larger difference. And if we go down below an STI of like 0.45, intelligibility goes down and diminishes very quickly. So here's a figure that's supposed to illustrate this. Um, we are looking at a figure that shows uh, STI on the horizontal axis. So the X axis goes from zero to one, which is the number or the data range for STI. On the vertical, we see subjective intelligibility scores. So we see three curves for different types of subjective intelligibility tests and their relationship to um, what the STI number would be for the same communication channel, right? Three different curves uh, from top to bottom. We start with phonetically balanced words, highly nonlinear. Then the second curve that goes straight up and then has this plateau very quickly, that is the sentence intelligibility. And then the third one is constant, uh, sorry, consonant, vowel, consonant, so-called equally balanced word scores. And that has probably the most linear relationship to the STI number. So one thing I want to point out here is that these are the six conditions we heard, right? And uh, in sentence intelligibility, those are the six blue dots. And you can see for condition uh, one, two, three, the sentence intelligibility is significantly increasing. But then we are already at an STI of about 0.6 we already have much more than 90, even more than 95% of sentence intelligibility. And that is, and after that, the sentence intelligibility doesn't increase any further. Um, and the main reason is um, you can get the meaning of a sentence also if you have only understood parts of the sentence, right? Because you can, you can kind of like um, think about what the rest must have been. Right. Um, similarly, if we mark an STI of 0.5, which is our typical limit for emergency systems, and uh, if we look at the sentence intelligibility, we see that below 0.5, the sentence intelligibility drops very quickly. And 0.5 is still at about 90%. But if we only go down to 0.4, we are already way below 60% sentence intelligibility. So looking at this figure, you can directly say it is much more important to improve a system um, by an, uh, 0.05 STI when you can go from, say, 0.4 or 0.45 upwards by 0 0.05, or if you compare that to an, to an increase of STI when you're already in the range of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, or 0 0.8, right? In those cases, the subjective difference is not so large, but if the intelligibility is very bad, it, is, it makes sense to invest as much as you can um, to make this better. So, um, Having said this, um, let's talk a little bit about the modulation transfer function. And in order to understand what that is, we need to introduce some properties of speech. And in order to do this, we just take a look at speech over time. So what you see here is some kind of level over time of how a typical speech signal would look like in terms of sound intensity. If, for example, you would record it and you would, uh, for intensity, you need to square it and then you look at it and then it would roughly look like this. And um, you can take the signal and you can put it into a spectral analyzer. So you can just put it into your whatever sound pressure level meter and you can look at how the spectrum looks like. That's what we would call an audible spectrum. Um, for speech, it typically contains uh, signal in the octave bands from 125 hertz to about 8 kilohertz. But what you can also do is you can take a look at 
the fluctuations in the signal. That's maybe a little bit more abstract to explain, but that's what we call modulation. We call it a modulation spectrum. And you can kind of like um, regard this as being the number of changes in the signal per time. Um, and while on the left side you see the audible spectrum is in between 125 hertz and 8,000 hertz, the typical modulation frequencies we deal with are much lower in frequency. So they are between DC or almost DC, no modulation, zero hertz, and about 12 hertz with a typical characteristical spectrum for human speech. Uh, and those are the modulations that we are mostly concerned with. So if, for example, birds are singing, they also use modulation in bird singing, um, but uh, they can go up to much higher frequencies and the bird would still hear his whistle as a modulated signal, but humans would only perceive it as a constant tone. So, and because this concept of modulation is something that is pretty common in uh, human perception, this is the idea we have. We think since modulation is so important for humans and their perception, the idea is to say, okay, we have a system that introduces a loss of modulation, then we can maybe relate that to a certain loss in intelligibility. And here you can see the, the basic approach we take. So we have an originally modulated signal on the upper left. We feed that into a sound system, and the sound system could be comprising of background noise, loudspeakers, bandwidth limitations, distortion, things like that. And then somewhere in that room, we measure an output of that system, and that has some kind of reduced modulation, as you can see on the lower right. And that is something we would like to evaluate. We will take a little detour and take a look at optics. And some of you may know these images from back then from analog television when it was like midnight and the program was over. Um, <clears throat> the television stations were transmitting these kind of images. And this is a way to evaluate the modulation transfer function in visual systems. So you can take cameras and optics in general, or you could take a TV and you could try to evaluate how well the TV can act to changes in the image. And we all know that if images change very slowly, uh, only a few times per second, the eye can still perceive it as um, individual images. But if you make that very fast, it looks like a continuous movie. So also in visual perception, modulation transfer is a very important aspect. So let's go back to audio and to speech and let's construct a test signal that we can feed into a, into a typical communication channel. We will take an octave band noise carrier, so just an octave band filtered noise, filtered in one of the octave bands that, are, um, that speech is consisting of, and then we will modulate this noise with a modulation frequency that also comes from the human modulation spectrum. So what you see on the bottom is a noise and it has a sinusoidal envelope, um, which is the modulation frequency. So essentially that is so-called amplitude modulation and the, um, uh, the modulating frequency is changing the volume of the noise in a very determined fashion, just like a sine wave. And that is the signal we put into our transmission channel. So before we do that, I will play you a few examples of how these signals may sound like. Um, and um, typically, you take any of the seven octave bands that are uh, in male or human speech, and then you take any of the modulation frequencies uh, that are apparent in uh, speech, and then you combine these. Um, and I did this here for two frequency bands, 1000 and 500 hertz, and for a couple of different modulation frequencies. You see them here on the table. And let me start by just playing noise, which is not modulated. Right, so this is just an octave uh, 
of noise centered around one kilohertz filtered with a bandpass filter. And now we will modulate this uh, three times per second. We can make this a little bit slower, so we modulate only once per second with one hertz modulation frequency. And we can also make it much faster, go into the upper range of modulation frequencies here, 10 hertz, and you can hear it almost sounds like a constant noise. You can still pick up that it's changing, but it's not so easy to pick up like with the other two examples. And of course, we can also go down one octave and do 500 hertz, again with uh, modulation three times per second. And <clears throat> now you can imagine that's quite a many uh, combinations of bass bands and modulation uh, frequencies. And uh, yeah, typically you are only exciting the communication channel in one octave band. And for some channels, that's probably not a realistic use case, right? Say you have a codec or something that needs to work uh, a broadband. Then you also need to make sure that your channel is also excited in the other bands that you are currently not evaluating. And the guys from TNO who originally invented the STI method, I come back to that uh, in the second part of the web webinar, they have made very special signals and so that you have a chance to, hear, to hear them. Here's the same signal again, 500 hertz, modulated three times per second, but including disturbing noises in the other frequency bands. Pretty strange signal. <laughs> Right, you can hear there's still the uh, 500 hertz modulated noise, but combined with uh, random signals in other bands. So, yeah, um, seven octave bands from 125 to 8 kilohertz, um, 12 modulation frequencies from uh, from 1 to 12 hertz. That's quite a bunch of signals. It's 98 to be exact. So that takes quite a while if you want to take all of them in succession and excite your communication channel. So there is other options to uh, combine these signals and um, play them all at the same time. And that's what we call Stiper. So that was a couple of modulated uh, noise signals at the same time. Um, we will come back later to this signal, but in this case, you are exciting the channel with 14 different signals simultaneously. So that means you can significantly cut down on your measurement time. And that is what the Stiper meters are essentially all about. Okay, let's head on and let's uh, look how we can calculate modulation loss from um, a typical system. So on the upper side, you see the input signal. On the lower side, you see the output signal. You can apply a couple of formulas to that. And uh, we won't go into the details, but you see there's a cosine. So that describes the modulation. There is an FT that describes the frequency of uh, the modulating uh, signal. And then if we compare the input and the output, we can we see there is an additional uh, factor that comes into the equation, which is called M uh, sub K. And that is what we call the so-called modulation index. And we can take that index and put it into a large table that gives us a field for every combination of octave band and modulation frequency, and we just drop this modulation index into this respective bucket. And then we repeat the measurements with all the other signals, and then sooner or maybe later, we have a completed matrix with all the buckets filled out. And this matrix with its numbers is called the modulation transfer function. If we just take one octave band from that transfer function and we evaluate it a little bit closer. We can graph it like this. 
And now we have a graph that shows modulation frequency on the x-axis and the amount of modulation preserved, the M value, on the y-axis. And then you can see a typical curve for a modulation transfer function. We can also do this for all seven octave bands at the same time. So here you can see a typical result, how it's predicted in Modeler, where you see the modulation transfer function for all seven octave bands in one single image. And the octave bands are color coded. So this was a simulated uh, impulse response. And before we go into more details about the modulation transfer function, maybe this is a good question to ask. Maybe Eva or Dave, you already have a question. Hey, well, Thomas, yeah, so <laughs> let me quickly look. Uh, we didn't receive a question yet, <clears throat> so, uh, but uh, now folks know that you can have an in-between question. Feel free to leave them right now. I will quickly highlight um, some of the, uh, we we we, uh, we triggered a poll during yeah. the um, session, so I would like to uh, before I really publish them, I would like to share where we are now. So the question was, um, and if, in the meantime, if you have a question, please feel free to leave them so we can ask Thomas. Um, so the question was for the poll: Do you perform STI simulations in a computer model? And if yes, which software do you use? So um, for now. Um, we see that 7% of the audience is using uh, CAP, 27% is using EASE, and 61% is using Modeler. We have 1%, or sorry, 2% uh, using Odeon, and we have 2% using other software tools. So this is really uh, <coughs> interesting to see that it's, uh, yeah, we are, you know, using the different tools here yeah. within the audience. Uh, so if you didn't uh, answer the poll question yet, please do so, and then I will... Um, we'll keep it open until the end of the webinar. And then I will publish it out so yeah. you have the latest overview. But for now, no questions. So uh, this morning I had a... Well, for us, this morning I had a question um, uh, for Thomas, but I, now I know actually <laughs> I know the answer already. But the question was if there are any uh, things or factors that, can, that have influence on the MTF, Thomas. Um, but I know that you're going to talk about that. So I think we just continue your, uh, with the presentation. Okay, so let's continue um, by looking at the influence of three major parameters on the modulation transfer function. And those three major parameters are signal-to-noise ratio, also known as background noise. Then we have reverberation. And then third, we also have discrete echoes. So let's take a look at the influence of background noise on the modulation of speech. And here we see an image again with amount of modulation on the y-axis and modulation frequency on the x-axis and assume uh, <clears throat> we originally had an MTF that was at one. Um, now when we add noise to the system, it has the effect of reducing the modulation transfer function independent of the modulation frequency. So you see the reduction of the MTF is the same for all modulation frequencies. That's a typical effect for adding noise to the modulation transfer function. And if we do that for a variety of um, signal-to-noise ratios, for example, you can see here it shifts the curve parallel to the x-axis uh, down. The, uh, the better the signal-to-noise ratio is, the, uh, the less the reduction is, and the uh, worse the signal-to-noise ratio is, the more reduction you see in the MTF. And you can directly relate a certain decibel value for signal-to-noise ratio into an equivalent um, STI number. So let's listen to a couple of um, speech tracks that are compromised by noise. And uh, you see here a table uh, with SNR values in the top column. Uh, we go from minus 15 dB of noise, so that means the signal is, has much less level than the noise, uh, to minus six, zero, and then positive values for signal to noise. And let me start with the minus 15. Uh, you see it has an STI of zero, so we can expect that we don't understand anything. Uh, and actually, we can barely hear uh, what that somebody is talking. 
So you heard the noise and maybe you heard somebody talking. <clears throat> um, these recordings are a little bit special because we made sure that the spectrum of the noise is exactly the same as the spectrum of the talker. So if we say it has minus 15 dB of signal to noise, it means the value is the same for each and every octave band. Let's continue with minus 6 dB of noise, uh, minus 6 dB of signal, I shall say. And the zero dB, so noise and signal have the same level. The front door may be stuck. The long alley was badly lit. The chicken laid no more eggs. The room was said to be quiet. We arrived home. And plus six dB of signal to noise. The front door may be stuck. The long alley was badly lit. The chicken laid no more eggs. The room was said to be quiet. We arrived home just in time. And as a last example, we maybe go to the upper end of the STI range in terms of SNR, that is uh, plus 15 dB of noise. The front door may be stuck. The long alley was badly lit. The chicken laid no more eggs. The room was said to be quiet. We arrived. And of course, plus 15 dB of signal, not plus 15 dB of noise. Okay, so apparently intelligibility and signal to noise ratio are highly correlated. And uh, that's actually no surprise for the expert because the STI is actually designed and defined to give a linear relationship between uh, what is called the effective signal to noise ratio of a system. We come back to that in part two of the webinar. Um, but most importantly, if you have an SNR of zero dB, so speech is exactly as loud as the noise, that will result in an STI of 0.5 if the signal to noise is constant with frequency. And the overall dynamic range for the STI goes from minus 15 dB of SNR to plus 15 dB of SNR. Okay, let's jump to the second uh, major parameter that influences uh, the modulation transfer function, that is reverberation. And uh, again, here we see a graph that shows the MTF for a system that is um, degraded by reverberation. And here you can see that we do not have the same reduction in modulation for all modulation frequencies, but we see that lower modulation frequencies are much less affected than higher modulation frequencies. And this is a typical point where I'm trying to explain another interpretation of modulation frequency. Um, and I'm typically trying to explain this by saying, okay, the modulation frequency, it somehow tells you how many words or how many word components you are talking per time. So in this case, per second. And you all know that if you are in a very reverberant room and you talk very slowly, then the reverberation can decrease in between, and I'm exaggerating this in my talk now, the reverberation can decrease in between the words. So it has much less influence on the intelligibility. And that is what you see here on the left side of the figure. But if you have somebody talking very fast and he does that in a very reverberant environment, then you won't understand much. And that is because he speaks so fast that the next syllable, the next word component, is still masked by the reverberation from what was said before. So very typical, what we would call, since we are in the frequency domain here, you see uh, frequency on the x-axis, reverberation introduces a low pass effect to the MTF. <clears throat> and here you can see how that looks like if you have different reverberation times, or I shall say um, reverberation times of exponentially decayed reverberation uh, in the impulse response. And you see, okay, sure, uh, 
the more reverberation, the more reduction in modulation. And uh, normally we would listen to a few examples here and I may repeat a few, but in essence, this is the same shoebox room we already heard. And uh, just to recalibrate you on the scale, let's take a quick listen at uh, a good intelligibility um, in a room with about one second reverberation time. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Kittil and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. And then we listen to the same thing in a four second reverberation room, but uh, in the same distance to the loudspeaker. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Kittil and I'm a member of the research staff here at Bose Corporation. So what did we learn again? Uh, reverberation has a very important impact on intelligibility. There is probably a breakpoint uh, if we would uh, quantify that at about 1.5 to 2 seconds of reverberation time. And if you are in a room that has higher reverberation, then system design for good intelligibility gets increasingly difficult. And um, as the intelligibility decreases, so do clarity and, of course, also details in music. And if reverberation is added to a communication channel, the modulation transfer function will show a low-pass filtered characteristics with higher reduction in modulation for higher modulation frequencies. So we have to uh, hurry up a little bit. So we come to the third influence, major influence on the modulation of speech. And this time we will take a look at discrete echoes, right? An echo is something different than reverberation. An echo is something where you have a discrete reflection, typically from a far away wall, and you just hear things twice. And um, if the time delay between your direct sound and the echo um, is large enough, it can have a very disturbing effect on intelligibility. Before we listen to that, here's the MTF, typical with echoes. In this case, there is no constant reduction. There is no low pass filter. In this case, it introduces a notch filter into the MTF. So if we have an echo in the system, it will lead to a situation where at certain modulation frequencies, um, we have almost zero modulation preserved, and then the modulation may increase again for higher modulation frequencies. And the actual delay time or the difference in time between the direct sound and the uh, reflected sound will determine at what point on the modulation frequency axis um, the modulation will go down to its minimum. So here you see we go again from top to bottom, small delay times on the top, 20 milliseconds. You don't see the notch at all. The notch occurs outside of the frequencies that we are interested in as humans. And then the more delay you add, the further the notch moves from the right to the left into the range of modulation frequencies we are typically concerned with. And <clears throat> the lowest figure here is 50, 70 milliseconds. We'll listen to that in just a minute. Um, that's already a disturbing echo for somebody, uh, for example, that needs to talk into a microphone and hears himself a few tenths of a millisecond uh, later. So let's listen to some of these late reflections. We have another shoebox room. It has relatively low reverberation, so we can concentrate on the echo, but there is still also degradation by reverberation in this simulation. We have two different loudspeakers, and one of the two is delayed, so we can... Um, create a second arrival at a controlled time. The uh, second arrival is exactly the same level as the first arrival, so it's a little bit of a worst case scenario. Um, we are changing delay times from 0 to 350, and we also have a little bit of spatial separation between the two sources, so roughly 20 degrees to the left and to the right, that you may not really hear when we do the presentation, but you can see if uh, you hear the direct sound more from the one side and the reflection more from the other side, um, that will certainly make the echo more um, audible. 
um, and we will talk about that in the second part of the presentation as well. So here are a couple of examples. Um, because we have reverberation in the room, uh, we don't have STI numbers that go up to one. So the best value we have is 0.66. And I'm just playing the standard track and you see how it sounds in this one second room. There is no easier way to disappoint and annoy listeners than to make speech difficult or impossible to understand. And now we will, I will skip a few examples here um, and we will jump to 40 milliseconds of delay for the echo. There is no easier way to disappoint and annoy listeners than to make speech difficult or impossible to understand. Right, that's maybe you need to concentrate that you can act, actually hear that there is a second arrival. That's still pretty coherent and adding positively to the intelligibility, so to speak. Um, now we go to 80 milliseconds. There is no easier way to disappoint and annoy listeners than to make speech difficult or impossible to understand. Right, and this is what is typically considered as being something like a fringe case. So from 80 milliseconds on roughly, uh, typically echoes are regarded as uh, being disturbing the actual speech. Uh, we continue with 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds, that is 30 meters uh, path length difference. There is no easier way to disappoint and annoy listeners than to make speech difficult or impossible to understand. And now if we go further, intelligibility will deteriorate very quickly. So we will try again with 150 milliseconds. There is no easier way to disappoint and annoy listeners than to make speech difficult or impossible to understand. There is no way to disappoint and listeners than to make speech difficult or And because it already gets a little bit crazy, we also listen to 350 milliseconds of delay. There is no easier way to disappoint and listeners than to make speech difficult or impossible to understand. So, I mean, the last example was probably pretty clear. You hear things already twice. And uh, yeah, if you hear things twice, that typically improves intelligibility or you have a second chance to listen to it, but not if the time difference is only a third of a second. So um, you can imagine we could have also listened to these examples with music. That can get really funky, especially if you have percussive music and uh, we have to skip that for today. But uh, you can imagine that if you are playing percussive music, um, such echoes will completely ruin your sound transmission. Okay, what did we hear and learn? Strong late arrivals, especially larger 100 milliseconds or 30 meters path length difference have a significant negative impact on intelligibility. The impact is, is depending on both the arrival time and also the relative level between the direct sound and the reflected sound. If you have strong echoes, they will create a notch or at least a dent in the MTF. And the frequency where this notch or the dent occurs is at a modulation frequency that is equal to the inverse of twice the time delay. So if you see a notch in an MTF, you can look what the modulation frequency is, and you can use this formula to calculate what the expected delay time is. And if you know that delay time, you probably already, and you transfer that to meters or distance, you probably already have a good estimate from which surface the echo uh, could have been caused. And then, as I said, music, like percussion, is very sensitive to echoes, so you have to know the application. And if music is supposed to be played, then you have to be even more careful about the avoidance of echoes. And um, I will talk about listening with two ears. 
again in the next seminar. But what I can already say is that a spatial separation of the direct sound and the echo will typically increase the audibility of the echo. So if the direct sound comes from a completely different direction than the echo, then uh, that may even get more disturbing than if they would come from the same direction. So this was it for today. Um, here's a quick outlook for part two. Uh, stay tuned for that. We do that in two days. We will take what we learned today and we take the MTF and convert it into the speech transmission index. So we will talk about the basics of converting the MTF into an STI number. We will then look at more details of the STI. So we will talk about things like spectra of speech. We will talk about masking effects. We will talk about how the STI can be measured. And if you have something that you have measured or that you may have simulated, how can you correct these results for certain parameters and how you shall analyze them to come to a, a number that tells you whether you complied with a certain standard, for example, for emergency sound systems. So that's it for today. Um, I hope you have a couple of questions and I would now like to hand over um, to Dave and Ivar to check what we have in the Q&A box and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, let's check the questions. Yes, thank you, Thomas. Thomas. So, I've um, seen some questions. So. Yeah, some came in and some were already disappeared because you answered them in the meantime. So we have, <laughs> yes, that can happen. That's always good. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a question here, Thomas, is, um, is STI calculated in the same manner across various simulation platforms? Well, um, every simulation platform shall uh, use the specifications from the STI standard. And uh, the precise answer would be a no. There is a uh, so one statistically based method that is specified in the STI standard that is also allowed, but uh, say the general recommendation is that you predict an impulse response and then you apply uh, the indirect method using the Schroeder equation. And then the whole post-processing, like what you do with the MTF, that is completely defined within the standard. Okay, great. The other question, um, does STI has to be measured on a specific dB level? Uh, yes, and uh, that level has to be specified. <laughs> so, <laughs> for example, if you if you have an emergency sound system, uh, then typically it runs at a certain level, right? Because you have you there's an estimation about how much background noise is to be expected, and you, then you want to have so and so many dBs of signal to noise. So, typical recommendation, for example, for a soccer stadium is that you have uh, between 100 and 105 dBA of speech level. So yeah, then you have to make an intelligibility measurement that either measures at that level, because that's very inconvenient. Um, you may measure at another level, but then you have to correct your result for the higher level. And we will talk about how that's done in part two of the webinar. Great. Right. Makes sense, uh, Thomas, thanks. So that um, wraps up the questions. Yeah, I don't see any questions. I do see, uh, thank you very much, thank you very much, and so on. So, and it's very interesting, and uh, John is looking forward to see part two. So we're going to see John in uh, at, on, on Thursday. Yeah, so stay tuned for part two. Thomas, thanks yep. a lot for today's uh, webinar. Thanks for listening. Yes, thank you, Thomas. And uh, I think we're good for today. If there are no questions, nope, anymore. Okay. Nope. So uh, thank you all, thank you Thomas, and I uh, hope to see you uh, on Thursday with the next uh, uh, part two of, uh, of the SCI webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, see ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.